expert panel members. Uh, Dr. Ravindra Mehta, sir. Uh, sir is senior consultant pulmonology, interventional pulmonology and critical care medicine, Apollo Hospitals, Bengaluru. Sir is an established clinician, avid researcher, and also an academician in the field of pulmonary medicine, respiratory and chest medicine, mm -hmm. critical care, and also sleep disorder medicine. Uh, sir has extensive uh, training and professional experiences, both in the US as well as in India. And also we have today on board uh, Dr. Parikshit Prayag, sir. Mm -hmm. Sir, this consultant infectious disease, transplant and immunocompromised infectious disease, Dinanath Mangeshkar uh, Hospitals and Research Center, Pune. Uh, Dr. Prayag, sir, is a renowned and uh, trained in transplant infectious disease consultant in the country. He's, he has a rich experience in infectious disease management, both here in the India and also in the US as well. And uh, Dr. Prachi Sathe, ma'am, we have our next expert uh, panelist. Uh, ma'am is uh, director of the uh, you know uh, of the ICU at Ruby Hall Clinic, and she is also a consulting physician at Pune. Ma'am is trained in the UK on international fellowship from Royal College of Physicians, Edinburgh, in critical care medicine. And ma'am also has a very rich history of uh, treating such critical cases, managing such critical cases. Uh, she is also an avid researcher and has a lot of publications. And she's also trained and honed uh, young upcoming minds in the field of uh, medicine. We are really honored to have you all on field. I welcome you, uh, Parishit Prayag, sir, Rajki Sathya, ma'am. Really honored to have you on the forum today. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Dr. Ravindra Mehta, sir, will join us a few minutes uh, later in. Uh, but I request the audience to stay in because we'll be starting the sessions now. Dr. Prachi Sathya, ma'am, will be the moderator for today. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ma'am will uh, actually take through the entire session and also she will be the uh, moderator for the uh, uh, panel discussion. Parikshit Prayag, sir, will be presenting a case of COVID-19 patient treated with remdesivir and also uh, Dr. Ravindra Mehta, sir, will be presenting on uh, some real-world evidence on the use of remdesivir in COVID-19 patients. And both Dr. Parikshit Prayag, sir, and Ravindra Mehta, sir, will be the panelists during the uh, panel discussion that we have. The Q&A session will run at the last, as I have mentioned before, and I request the audience to put in your questions on the Q&A icon. You can also share your opinion and your comments if you have any. And uh, with this, I would now request uh, Prachi ma'am to please uh, take over the session ma'am. Uh, over to you ma'am, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sunny. And I thank Mylan for organizing this interesting meeting i bring you greetings for festive season recently we have had dashera most of the times we celebrate dashera by starting new things but this was a very unique dashera when we started closing down the icus for covid so it was really a good feeling and we are generally coming around coming out of this unprecedented times of covid the whole world went through in 2020 through these unprecedented times. But more so the medical fraternity. Because we have only been trying to solve the questions for last eight to nine months. Because we were facing an unknown disease. We were facing unknown pathophysiology. We did not know how the disease was behaving. And there were no known drugs to start with. Points of this COVID pandemic. We were lucky in India to be a little later on the timeline. That is why probably we were able to learn from the experience of the rest of the world, the Western countries. So this advantage really came to us as a benefit or an advantage. By that time, the repurposing of the drugs had started because there were no known drugs. Many drugs came with promise, but disappeared also equally soon. For example, it's secures also we know the stories. This repurposing of drugs, of course, gave us a lot of insight, at least into what does not work. And gradually came remdesivir. It got tested in the past on RNA viruses. And that is why with some experience of SARS and MERS, etc., it started showing some promises in the given pandemic of COVID. And then started many trials. As was mentioned by Dr. Sani, actually, there has been thousands lakhs of articles which have got published on some other other evidence and to make sense out of all that all that is a very very big task for an academician or for a practicing physician for that matter 
but with based on whatever data was there fda ultimately approved remdesivir in the month of may 2020 for the use in covid we still did not know in which patients of covid early or late with or without any other drugs so many trials came of course these trials which came in huge numbers most of them are not of very good quality because the scenario kept on changing there were changing combinations of drugs there were changing times during which the drugs got started so every trial could not compare apple to apple or oranges to oranges so the data collection was huge but it was inadequate or not of really good quality but still despite that some proof started coming forward showing us the usefulness of remdesivir at least a tendency towards the use of remdesivir so we still have lots of unanswered questions from whatever available data whether remdesivir and placebo can be compared and is, is there definite evidence of advantage whether 5 days or 10 days of remdesivir is good whether early or late in the disease that is at the beginning or the beginning of second week it is good to use the antiviral drugs the solidarity trial compiled a lot of data and what is that data how i can apply it to my own patient when i am treating in my hospital the outcomes which were primary and secondary endpoints in remdesivir studies do they actually guide us in our current scenario or practical use and what are the side effects of remdesivir and what precautions we should take especially while treating patients who have deranged renal function deranged liver function or pregnant women and whether use of remdesivir is going to reduce the post covid complications like fibrosis or uh, delayed fatigue so let us hope there is no second wave in india but if at all we should be quite wise about the use of remdesivir in that scenario so let us have an interesting session i am looking forward to this evening regarding remdesivir so i think the first session is going to be conducted by dr parikshit prayag who is going to present an interesting case i can hand it over to dr parikshit is my screen visible yes sir we can we can see this okay thank you so much uh, uh, prachi ma'am and good evening everyone so as ma'am said you know in the next uh, 45 minutes or so we would be trying to just discuss a little bit about where remdesivir fits into the protocols what have we learned after managing these patients for about 6 months and probably now for the last 3 or 4 months with the availability of the antivirals has it made the job of taking care of these patients easier or has it added to just more confusion so i'm going to present a small case it's it's only going to be a 10 minute presentation so i'm going to focus on one particular aspect of remdesivir and as ma'am mentioned you know there are unanswered questions as to using it in pregnant women safety studies efficacy studies whether breastfeeding or lactating women can be given remdesivir what about patients who have baseline renal damage to begin with would you use it in patients who have undergone renal transplants would you use it in patients who have undergone liver transplants so so i will try to address one particular question uh, through a case and and try to answer it because it's only a 10 minute presentation so that is what i'll try to do okay so my case is a 17 year old gentleman who had cough fever and myalgia for about 3 days on day 3 of his illness his outside general practitioner got a ct chest done and the ct chest showed a score of 5 by 25 so he had mild involvement and he had rt pcr which was positive outside again he had low cycle threshold values now as we have learned through the course of the pandemic the cycle threshold of the pcr just tells me the cycle threshold of the nasopharyngeal or the oropharyngeal swab it really doesn't tell me the kind of viral titers or the viral loads that exist in the lower respiratory tract again even these numbers are you know subject to a lot of technical errors it depends really on the timeline 
or the day of illness on which you have performed there could be sampling errors you know if you take the swab from multiple sites these numbers again may not really correlate so there are, there are multiple issues with cycle thresholds and really our, our, our in house data also has shown us that patients who had cycle thresholds of less than 20 or even who had more than 30 really did not have much of a difference as far as outcome was concerned in, in our own in house data there, there is slight higher mortality in patients who had cycle thresholds of less than 20 to begin with but like i said these these are not numbers that should be used to guide therapy but in yes so he at at the outset he had a fairly high viral load in his nasopharyngeal swab that's all that we can say with these numbers again when he got his markers done outside here the crp of 23 which was slightly high usually most labs will have the numbers as between 0 and 6 as the normal numbers so he was started on steroids again this is a controversial thing whether we should give steroids to patients based on their crps uh, marla keller again from montefiore has done some work on this and she recommends that you know she has shown us that you, uh, patients who have higher crps may benefit with early steroids personally i don't do that but one thing is for sure if patients are not hypertrophic and patients do not in elevated markers then probably steroids do more harm than good So with this modest vitamin C R P, he was actually started on steroids outside. He worked steroids for about three days and then became hypoxic. Uh, at which point of time, they repeated a C T of the chest and the score had gone up from five by twenty-five to fifteen yeah, yeah, by twenty-five. So he had gone into the moderate to severe category. Usually, sixteen to twenty-five mm-hmm. is the severe category. And then he was transferred to us in the Nanak Mangeshkar Hospital. Okay, okay. But so this is these this, the, the, these kind of reflect his C T changes. So when we started. Uh, oh. He had a score of five by twenty-five oh, and had gone up to fifteen by twenty-five. So clearly, this was a patient who had probably seen increased viral replication and more and more involvement of the lower respiratory tract. Whether oh. steroids had something to do with it is conjectural, but probably yes, because he was started on steroids when really there wasn't a great indication yeah, to start him on yeah. steroids, and probably that accelerated yeah, the viral replicative phase and led yeah, to yeah, more lower yeah. respiratory yeah. involvement. Interestingly, he had a creatinine of 2.5, and his baseline creatinine was normal about three months back. He had a slightly high uh, potassium level, and probably clinically we suspected direct renal involvement with COVID. Probably something like a type four RTA or or a, or a hyperkalemic renal tubular acidosis kind of a picture. As we all know that the kidneys do have a fair number of ACE receptors, so he did have or probably had COVID-related direct kidney injury. His calculated GFR was 25. So he was a 70-year-old gentleman with a creatinine of 2.5. So his calculated GFR was 25, just below the recommended threshold for using remdesivir. His LFTs were normal at that point of time. CRP, as I mentioned, you know, hadn't really crept up in three days. It had almost remained the same. Peritin wasn't very high at that point of time. IL-6 was 29. So by the time he got to us on day six, he required four liters of oxygen and had already received steroids for about. Three days. So really, the big question at that point of time was, what was the pathophysiology of his hypoxia? Of course, it was too early in the course for us to suspect secondary bacterial or fungal infections. We got an echo that was normal, did not really have any signs of myocarditis, did not really have any signs of cardiac involvement. So really, the only differential was whether he was brewing up an early cytokine storm versus whether this was direct uh, viral mediated alveolar damage. Probably with these kind of markers, so the CRP not going up. Ferritin being fairly under control, and with him receiving three days of steroids, and with him being early in the course of the illness, remember his worsening was from day three to day six. Probably we had to put our money on direct viral worsening and viral mediated alveolar damage. So really, the question that was before us was that should we give this patient antivirals at that point of time, and with with a reasonable certainty that you know his his worsening is probably directly related to the virus at that point of time. Again. The option at that point was remdesivir. So the question was for a patient in whom you really think that there is direct viral worsening, should you give remdesivir when he has a GFR of 25? So let let me try and answer this question and try and answer that how how uh, fixated should we be over this GFR cutoff of 30? So how does remdesivir work? Prachin, I mentioned briefly that you know remdesivir is an RNA viral inhibitor, so it does terminate the RNA synthesis of the virus. Originally, it was a drug which was sort of marketed in the Ebola epidemic. Uh, to take care of RNA, but it is a general RNA virus inhibitor. So, really, the question is how nephrotoxic is remdesivir? So, let me try and answer this question because that's relevant to my patient and that's relevant to whether I'll give someone who has a GFR of 25 whether I'll give him remdesivir. 
So let me try and answer this question by answering two aspects. How nephrotoxic is remdesivir and how nephrotoxic is cyclodextrin. So we all know that remdesivir has a vehicle which is known as cyclodextrin, similar to IV vodicone. Remdesivir is formulated in a vehicle known as cyclodextrin. Now remdesivir is usually unstable in, 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 in the hepatic environment. So we will never have an oral form of remdesivir. So we will always have IV remdesivir because it will it is not able to bypass the first pass metabolism. So uh, with this vehicle which is known as cyclodextrin, which is also the same vehicle that we use in IV vodicone as well, how much nephrotoxicity does that contribute to? So really, if you split that up, remdesivir by itself is not very nephrotoxic. So if you see toxicology studies in animal models, they have shown us that, you know, at usual doses of 5 milligrams per day, well, I mean 5 milligrams per kg per day or 10 milligrams per kg or 20 milligrams per kg for 7 days, really the risk of acute kidney injury or acute tubular necrosis is not very high. Also, it doesn't really cause that much of a mitochondrial damage. With RNA and DNA viral inhibitors, we are also worried about mitochondrial damage. So really, the studies have shown us that at these doses, it's not very nephrotoxic. Now, usually, the kind of doses that we are using for remdesivir is 200 milligrams on day one and 100 milligrams for the remaining four days. So that for most patients comes out to be about one to two milligram per kg per day. And there have been studies which have shown us that even at five, 10 and 20 milligrams per kg for seven days, it really doesn't bother the kidneys to that extent. Now, so then why are we so worried about remdesivir? So the reason why I worry about remdesivir is more so because of the cyclodextrin component and less so because of remdesivir. So what does data on cyclodextrin tell us? So again, for, for this, we have a little bit more experience because we can extrapolate that situation at least somewhat from IV voriconazole usage. So again, animal mod uh, models have told us that the kind of liver necrosis and re renal tubular obstruction which occurs with cyclodextrin occurs at doses which are 50 to 100 fold higher than what we use in COVID. So if you see each 100 milligrams of the lyophilized powder and solution of remdesivir, they contain three or six grams of the vehicle, the SBC, SBCD is the cyclodextrin vehicle, which is well below the maximum recommended safety threshold of 250 milligrams per kg per day of the cyclodextrin vehicle. So again, if you, if you see animal studies and if you see in vitro models, both for sure remdesivir and even cyclodextrin at doses of 200 for on the first day and, and 100 for the remaining four days are really not expected to be that nephrotoxic. Now the problem comes if someone has elevated renal num uh, numbers, then we are worried about accumulation of cyclodextrin. There is no doubt that we are worried about accumulation of cyclodextrin. We, it may not itself be very nephrotoxic in that, that situation, but we are worried about accumulation of cyclodextrin. Now, if cyclodextrin accumulates, then there can be hepatic necrosis, there can also be CNS derangements, patients can have seizures. That, that is what can be seen with cyclodextrin accumulation. And that is what we really need to be careful about. Even if we use our own IV vodiconazole experience, short courses are usually well tolerated. With IV vodiconazole, even with IV vodiconazole, most of the nephrotoxicity occurs as you have a graded exposure and as you have continued accumulation of cyclodextrin. So more in the second, third, fourth weeks of IV vodiconazole. So usually cyclodextrin is readily removed by renal replacement therapy and hemodialysis. So again, something that should make us breathe a little easier. In, in the odd patient in whom we do have cyclodextrin accumulation and toxicity, we will definitely be able to remove it by dialysis. But having said that, it is extremely important to monitor creatinine in the LFTs daily in these patients. And the reason is that a little bit of cyclodextrin accumulation. So if you have someone who has baseline deranged kidneys, even to a certain extent, and even if there is some baseline liver damage to a certain extent, then that is the patient in whom this is more likely to be problematic. Because what can happen is cyclodextrin can accumulate, of course. It can accumulate a little bit more with the renal impairment and with a baseline liver that's not perfect, it can lead to even more hepatic necrosis. So the dual uh, affected patients, patients who have both baseline deranged kidneys and liver numbers, are these are the ones that I'm particularly worried about when it comes to remdesivir. If someone like him, in, in whom we know that you know this, the, the patient doesn't have bad kidneys to begin with, he had a transient elevation in the creatinine or probably has had an acute renal damage with COVID, which is very likely to be reversible and has an underlying perfect liver and therefore probably can afford a little bit of cyclodextrin accumulation. I will not be terribly worried. At that point of time, again, I have to balance the uh, risk versus benefit. So is there really a benefit in giving this patient remdesivir versus is there a real risk in giving this patient remdesivir? 
even if you see uh, the remdesivir trial uh, from lancet the which which is probably the largest data on the safety of remdesivir in um, patients then if you see uh, here events leading to drug discontinuation then acute kidney injury was seen only in one patient in the remdesivir group out of the 155 now we have treated close to 13000 patients in the nanak mangeshkar hospital and i can remember only three patients in whom probably the remdesivir led to the rise in creatinine which was again transient and very much reversible again whether remdesivir increases the risk of acute kidney injury acute kidney injury this is a recent systematic review and meta analysis which is yet to be published so it is not peer reviewed i must say like a lot of other formal evidence and again if you see the p values or uh, it really doesn't seem to suggest a tremendous risk of nephrotoxicity with remdesivir so again at the uh, in summary it's, it's a very short presentation but in summary i am not at all trying to say that we should give remdesivir to patients who have renal damage but the only thing is that you know gfr of 30 should not be set in stone may, uh, a lot of my colleagues uh, in in stanford are actually using a gfr cut off of 20 so although the manufacturer label does mention a gfr cut off of 30 we have to interpret that in uh, in the clinical context so let's say i have a patient in whom i am fairly certain that this is direct viral damage is early in the course of the illness i think that clinically he will benefit with remdesivir is worsening and again worsening because of direct viral damage and on the other hand i think that you know he has a very transient acute kidney injury has underlying good kidneys and good liver and i have the uh, resources to do daily monitoring of his renal and um, liver parameters i would not be very hesitant in using remdesivir as against this probably if you have if i have a patient who is you know sort of worsening on day 12 or day 13 Markers are going up. I'm not sure whether this is direct viral damage. And if someone who has baseline CKD to begin with, uh, maybe a little component of fatty liver here and there, and let's say has a GFR of 35, then again this would be the exactly opposite situation. Then probably even with the GFR of 32 or 33, I will not risk remdesivir in that patient. So really, I wanted to present this short case to tell you that each patient has to be interpreted differently. We have to really ascertain or try and ascertain the pathophysiology of his COVID worsening. And really, very carefully weigh the risks of his nephrotoxicity and liver toxicity with using something like remdesivir. So again, thank you so much for your patient listening, and I look forward to the rest of the evening. That is really very interesting, interesting way of presenting the data. I think, uh, I think questions we will go at the end for both the talks. Uh, and we would go ahead with the second presentation and i would like dr ravindra mehta dr ravindra mehta yeah, 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 yeah. the real world data of remdesivir whatever is available yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you very much dr sate thanks to my land and uh, uh, we can continue this uh, interesting story which has been uh, either a uh, Uh, a shortstopper uh, controversial. That still, that space is still talked about actively. In the next uh, 15 minutes, I'll be talking about uh, uh, some data related to remdesivir in the Indian context, and it's pretty much data which comes from um, our center as we went through the COVID onslaught. So the background, the name of this particular presentation is that obviously uh, in the various randomized controlled trials, and interestingly, as was talked about, there's not too many of them. Uh, in hospitalized COVID-19 patients, clearly the time to clinical recovery and trend towards lower mortality was shown. By and large, most of the studies targeted trend clinical recovery because mortality is a very uh, big thing to look at. And as the studies were done, looking at various severities of COVID, uh, clinical recovery, ordinal scales, uh, length of hospital stay, that was what was ultimately uh, mentioned. Uh, there was a quite time question of timing as with all the drugs that early initiation make a difference and there's a lot of uh, suggestions and uh, points made but nothing uh, categorical then came solidarity very recently solidarity basically tried to put a nail in the coffin on uh, the mortality role of remdesivir but however there's a lot of problems and as uh, pariksha was trying to point out solidarity is also a meta rx upload and it's going through its peer review and there's many pros and cons and so on and so forth when it was done and that's a whole discussion but nevertheless in the midst of all that the us fda who is supposed to be the regulator we all look at though of course each regulator has its own pluses and minuses in the pandemic approve remdesivir for all hospitalized patients where of course in bracket would be or in parenthesis would be the understanding that 
uh, whom do you hospitalize for COVID is very important. So that would be important, in, uh, that would be relevant in uh, most countries where you reserve your hospitals for the patients who are going to uh, merit, I mean, the, to, to, to improve with hospitalization. So this was the, uh, the approval which just came and became the first antiviral to get that approval. However, there is no study which measured the benefit of remdesivir between the symptom onset and remdesivir treatment, and we called it SORT or SORT. And uh, do we have any data on that? For like this one. So the acronym which goes is, is early good. And how early is early? When is it that you say, okay, as Parikshit was pointing out in his case, that uh, I'm not sure I should be giving remdesivir or no, and uh, sort of a, uh, a pro-con analysis was being done over there. So what was the study which was conducted by us is that we uh, tried to evaluate the impact of the timing of remdesivir recession. And again, reiterate the acronym OT, SORT, which stands for Symptom Onset to Remdesivir Treatment on in-hospital cause mortality in moderate to severe COVID-19. Apologies, this just moved over here. But uh, the idea was that at that time when we started looking at this, it was approved only and utilized uh, mainly for moderate to severe COVID-19. Uh, mild or hospitalized mild, none of us were using it in the time this was done. The design is a retrospective study. As you can imagine, there's no prospective randomness, which is easy after the pandemic has hit us uh, uh, and, and uh, a blind side. And so in this particular analysis, we took the first 350 consecutive patients with moderate to severe COVID-19 and 346 were included based on four having uh, adverse drug reactions, which precluded using of the uh, continuation of the drug. Moderate disease was defined just like in the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, you know, uh, mirroring WHO, where you have uh, pneumonia with a saturation of 90 to 94 and a commensurate respiratory rate. And of course, severe went to the next level of worsening all the way up to very, very critically ill patients. The methodology, the methodology was uh, what outcomes we looked at. We looked at this interval, SORT, the symptom onset to remdesivir uh, treatment interval and its impact on in-hospital mortality. And of course, we also looked at our overall in-hospital mortality, length of hospital stay, and safety issues. Statistics were done uh, using the kapler meyer plots. And then we looked at the, the cutoff, that is it six days, seven days, eight days, nine days, or 10 days. And further analysis were, using, were done using appropriate statistics. I will not inundate you with the statistical techniques, but those of you interested know that these are standard techniques. And a multivariate regression analysis was done to compare mortality uh, based on the latency between symptom onset and rem disease. So be very clear. Today I have a symptom. What day, up to what day is giving rem disease going to impact on my mortality? So again, a flowchart to demonstrate what was done. 350 patients, four discontinued because of uh, adverse effects. Final tally 346. And two groups were made based on the kaplan meier curve. Uh, curve. One is the short latency, that means symptom onset to remdesivir treatment latency less than equal to nine days and more than nine days. Interestingly, most of our patients got remdesivir early, probably reflecting a huge amount of awareness in the pandemic where they were rushing to hospitals to get admitted, assuming they got the bed at that time. And a lesser number were coming late because of all the reasons which uh, we have all seen as being a challenge in treating them. Baseline characteristics of these patients that came uh, age average reflected what is going on in the pandemic. A good deal of them were males, and they reflected comorbidity spectra similar to what was seen in the other trials. Hypertension, diabetes, CKD. Um, uh, Parikshit took a good session on that, and uh, uh, some of these patients did get uh, remdesivir. And of course, we had most of our patients were severe, reflecting the fact that those were the patients we were admitting and not trying to get anybody who was asymptomatic and so on. I mean, my asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. And of course, some of them were uh, one third were literally moderate. Uh, in terms of respiratory support, uh, mechanical ventilation was given to around 14%, and others received uh, uh, some sort of uh, either supplemental oxygen or the HFNC and IV tools, which were used so commonly in the pandemic. What were the results? Mortality and length of hospital stay. So a little complex, just bear with me. In overall, our patients, basically, we had a mortality of 22% in this moderate to severe cohort, uh, and 78% made it to discharge. Obviously, in the moderate group, of this, of these 22%, very few moderates died, as would be expected. The ones who basically died converted to severe and went on the machines and did not make it. However, in the severe category, we had uh, the higher mortality spectrum, 31%. And in our ventilated patients, we had a pretty high mortality, largely due to the fact that 
there was a big push towards continuing NIV HFMC as much as possible rather than getting onto invasive ventilation. So here, the length of stay mirrored the, the prognosis. The average was around 11 days. The moderates got out faster. The severe spent more time and the ventilated guys obviously more. Um, and so th this reflected by and large two things, the severity of disease and of course the pandemic uh, uh, discharge criteria, which were often mandated by the state also. What about the main outcome? to remdesivir treatment latency and its impact on outcome. Well, you can see the coupling way analysis. I'll make it very simple for you. This is a, a greater than nine, and this is less than equal to nine. So clearly, the ones, the ones who were who got remdesivir before nine days had a much better mortality than the ones who got it more than nine days. So this came out as a major part of uh, of the analysis. And then, of course, we looked at the, the groups. Are they matched? Because somebody is going to say that if your groups are not matched, what does it matter? Turns out we looked at age, gender, comorbidities, a major part of the whole thing, the severity. All were decently matched. The P, num the P values are pretty similar. But clearly, in the, uh, in the group less than nine days, the ones who were discharged were significantly more than the ones who did not make it. So the length of hospital stay obviously was not very different. And uh, in the severity criteria, most of uh, uh, the ones who had an advantage of remdesivir in the severe category. So here, clearly symptom onset to remdesivir day uh, treatment less than nine days is associated with a significant mortality benefit. Uh, what about the forest plot? So you know, again, uh, apologies for those of you who don't really love statistics. I'll make it very simple. Here you can see less than nine days and more than nine days. So whatever's to the left of the graph is good stuff. And whatever's in the center doesn't matter. So here in the severe subgroup, if you got remdesivir less than nine days from symptom onset, please note it is symptom onset and not diagnosis onset. So you have to actually ask about symptom onset. These guys had a mortality benefit compared to those who got it later. In the moderate, it did not matter, but understand we had only three moderate deaths, so it's not going to reflect in that in a big way. In the mechanically ventilated population also, it was marginal. And so this is a major subgroup looked at that actually should these patients be getting uh, remdesivir or no, but there was only a marginal advantage out here. But overall, in the moderate to severe group, sub, uh, subgroup, we had a definite mortality benefit when we gave remdesivir less than nine days. So conclusion is that this study with the detailed analytics is one of the first ones to show that in the subset of hospitalized patients with moderate to severe COVID, a uh, symptom onset to remdesivir treatment interval less than nine days is associated with the mortality benefit. And it reiterates, reinforces, and repeats the need to give remdesivir early, which has been the major challenge and the question in the pandemic. Reading between the lines, understanding and positioning the drug, current hypothesis, as was also mentioned earlier, is that the antiviral is likely maximally effective at an earlier stage of the disease when there is antiviral replication and you hope that when you uh, arrest or, or slow down the viral replication, you'll have a spillover effect on inflammation, thrombosis and the rest of the sequelae. It is very important to define that window period, which is what we attempted to do. Additionally, considering that the first clinical indicator of rival, viral replication, namely symptom onset, not diagnosis, but symptom onset, after initial exposure is five days. So this is your clueless time. You're not treating at all. Clearly, once you get a symptom and you get a certain severity of illness, minimizing the interval between the symptom and treatment initiation does assume greater importance. So clearly, at this point, remdesivir, at least on 4th November, is the only antiviral strategy in moderate to severe COVID, which has some benefit with low toxicity. Clearly, it's easy to administer because it's a one-day, once a administration with less side effects and the only injectable at this point, as we talked about. The major question in literature, which is confusing and has been given signals, is when and who is, to, is to, to give the key. And that's why I think solidarity has been a little off because many lumber sort of study. You take four drugs, you put everything out there. It's an early stage of the pandemic and you ask people to give minimal upload. And then you say mortality and try to rule out a drug. So those of us who only like to read abstracts and not go through the fine print, we will say it's not useful. That's the press equivalent. That means the press who tries to say this is not there. But you know, otherwise, if you go into practice and you look at the data, obviously you'll have different conclusions as we are trying to corroborate now. So to leave a message early seems to be the key. Early, our data seems to suggest nine days, at least in this severe subset from the mortality point of view. 
and obviously when you look at other um, outcomes and i started my talk i mentioned that such as clinical recovery and length of hospital stay they're more reasonable for the moderate groups and the mild with comorbidities whom you hospitalize so that i think is there because there you'll never find a mortality advantage there you'll only be able to look at these particular endpoints when it comes to mechanical ventilation i'm not putting the slide it seems to be that if you get early mechanically ventilated which means that you are a severe subset with a combination of viremia and an inflammatory uh, syndrome then the drug may have a role but later down the line when patients slip through the cracks and uh, to fail and and oxygen and vhf is get mechanically ventilated quite likely the industry will not have much of a role to play at that point so with this we complete the, our analysis over here Clearly, the remdesivir story will continue to resolve. Uh, now, about this paper, we're trying to also do what Parikshit said. We're going to put it first in MedRx4, probably in the next couple of days, and then send it to a journal if they look at it from the point of view that you need real-world analysis now. No longer can we do an RCT very easily when the drug is approved as a clear unequiv unequivocal administration for a certain category of disease. So we'll have to look at it carefully now and weigh both the available data and clinical experience to continue using in the pandemic, first wave, second wave, third wave, whatever the case may be. Thank you very much for the attention. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mehta. You have done a commendable job to collect so much of data and analyze it that fast. So very interesting. Even though it does still remain, uh, leaves us with certain questions. So I think we will go towards panel discussion and uh, there are certain questions and answers which are coming up. And even I would like to let the ball rolling. So uh, you asked, you answered the question through your study, Dr. Mehta, that earlier the better. But obviously the viral replication, as Dr. Parishit might say, is maximum during the beginning of second week. Similarly, cytokine storm also is maximum at the beginning of the second week. So what would be the right time to start, according to you, Dr. Parikshit? Well, if you see the pathophysiology of the virus itself, you know, it is, it is like any other virus, it's going to involve the upper respiratory tract, then try and go down into the lungs. Then it's it's then the virus is going to attach. This is a, this is a little different for COVID. It's going to try and damage the epithelium as well as the endothelium, and that is what is going to set the process of you know alveolar damage. It's going to set the process of uh, in action of pulmonary intussusception, microthrombosis, and so on. And then you will have the sort of exaggerated cytokine response or the immune mediated damage. If you see autopsy studies again in in later on in the illness, they have shown a lot of. Uh, CD4 as well as CD8 uh, in the alveoli, uh, pulmonary intussusception, and earlier on they have shown you know uh, more vital mediated damage. So I think if you, if you see that then then definitely with any antiviral earlier is the better. Having said that, should we put these patients on remdesivir the day we diagnose COVID-19? I don't think so. I think for us to really use remdesivir, we really need to have at least lower respiratory involvement. Because you know, if you have to, uh, if you use these antivirals in patients with just upper respiratory involvement, I don't think it, it's really going to make any difference. Most of our asymptomatic or mild patients with only upper respiratory involvement are going to do well regardless of you know what you use. So I think the the real good time is the moment we find any evidence of lower respiratory involvement. Now that could be early hypoxia, that could be definite radiographic worsening. So the, that is a little bit open to sort of interpretation and discussion. Again, if you see the ACT study, doctor, what Dr. Mehta beautifully showed us right now, you know, the, with, with early also, you, you have to bear in mind how early. So if you see the ACTT trial again, patients who required again, a low amount of oxygen or low flow oxygen were the ones who probably benefited the most. For the most part of the pandemic, really, the moment remdesivir became available right up, up to probably last week, I, in, in the Lana, they had made it a strict protocol to use remdesivir with the earliest evidence of hypoxia. Now, I'm a little bit more liberal as to you know using it for patients who have only radiographic worsening. I don't oppose it, but personally, I use it just at the onset of hypoxia. The first sign of hypoxia, when you make them walk, and if there is a more than 3% drop in saturation or there is an earliest evidence of hypoxia, I use remdesivir. Okay. I think that is quite interesting. Actually, your case which you presented started with a low score of CT and within very short time, it 
progress towards very high severe score ct score ct severity score i am talking about so in such situation whether it should have been started much earlier uh, rem remdesivir so probably in my case steroids should not have been started rather than remdesivir being started so i think if if steroids wouldn't have been started it may have been again this is conjectural at what point of time you should use steroids personally i really don't do crp guided steroid therapy although i must say that you know we are inviting marla keller for our national id conference next week the one who uh, at montefiore who has done this study saying that you know if crp is higher than 20 you should give steroids and if crp is lower than lower than 10 these patients actually will do worse with steroids but both the jama uh, study on corticosteroids as well as uh, the recovery trial have clearly shown that for patients who did not need oxygen the mortality was probably higher in in, in that group we have to also take into account our situation here in india with early steroid usage because as you you will both agree with me that in the icu especially we are seeing tremendous amount of acinetobacter klebsiella and aspergillus so really early steroids in india has to be taken with a pinch of salt and i am not extrapolated from foreign studies i i i i am a believer of using steroids with the earliest evidence of hypoxia and using direct antivirals with the earliest evidence of hypoxia i am really not and using any antivirals for very mild disease or asymptomatic right we saw even some mucormycosis in these patients after use of steroids but then when you are using remdesivir i think we should use uh, properly indicated cases with steroids dr mehta i would like to ask you one more one question in your uh, study what was the duration of remdesivir used yeah so by and large it's a very good question and so in the upload we are doing we put a clear disclaimer Please. that our study was not geared up towards looking at the 5 to 10 day uh, question so i think your question basically mirrors the general no, question in which of day not 10 day that was that the treatment cost thinner which actually like to look at 5 to 10 days and they said that there is no global advantage of 5 to 10 days but then they put a subgroup Please. analysis saying that in the subgroup of mechanically ventilated patients 10 days had an advantage oh, so they left a little tail confusion when you look at the details of what is there in our cohort we used it for 5 days for most people who improved however patients who did not completely improve it was used longer we were not in a position to exactly capture which was 5 which was 10 so we tried to keep it out of that uh, realm uh, but our practice at this point is to use 5 days for most people and 10 days sparingly on a case to case basis for people where the where they have come early uh, you know they're still within the 10 day window there is a suspicion of viral activity and an issue of inflammatory activity and a lot of it is a treating consultant believes that it should be continued for a while on the other hand now this is a very personal thing if they go on the ventilator after a while uh, on hmm. remdes way we have found that it doesn't make any difference at all so a later uh, ventilating strategy Uh, after uh, uh, no, in uh, 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 limited success uh, no no success niv hfnc we don't tend to continue beyond 5 days so currently all guidelines are going to say 5 days with a sparing 10 very extended protocol and a little thing in your mind that if they come with early mechanical ventilation they may benefit with 10 days right see it is intuitively that happens in india that if the severe infection antibiotics go on and on for long time i think something very similar that if patient is in very severe condition and is not improving after 5 days of remdesivir we generally tend to continue it 10 for 10 days or extended periods but the trials have clearly shown that there is not much difference in 5 days or 10 days duration and uh, there was lot of hue and cry even in indian press that remdesivir is being used indiscriminately in indian scenario and not, not in indicated patients so i think it is for all of us to learn that 5 days is good enough period and uh, we we must give that message to all our uh, listeners so india boasts the death rates to be low as compared to the western world so do you both agree to that and uh, what could be the reason you feel and um, does remdesivir have to first. do anything because uh, remdesivir came uh, available to us in earlier phase as far as the pan progression of pandemic in india is concerned so well, does no. all this data correlate 
first thing is that uh, where we have to ask ourselves with a lot of humble pie that is our data absolutely accurate that is has every part of this massive country of 1.2 billion from the best urban areas to the least uh, uh, to the most rural areas given us accurate data and then that would decide that otherwise it's a moot point and you know frankly we don't know that particular answer a lot of questions on you died off covid with covid covid related deaths what has been going on home covid deaths many things have been talked about so we don't know that now the second is assuming that there is a extent of veracity in this uh, many articles are coming up one is of course the fact that yes we did at least part of the country has seen the covid in the later part of the pandemic i mean you guys in maharashtra got hit early we were nicely watching the sidelines in bangalore with a lot of netflixing going on till june when it hit us over there so at that point uh, we were better prepared one believes i mean i have uh, the reason we were able to collect this data patch is because we got them desperate from the word go So we've not had to struggle too much. I can't. I don't remember many times that I've had to deprive patients of remdesivir truthfully, and we were able to give it to the moderate to severe category. So maybe it's the drug. Maybe it's better understanding. And I would put recovery-related steroids. That steroids were used, uh, I think, a little earlier. So both remdesivir steroid proactive approach, ability of the bed, the system to have beds, intensive care, machines which were required, staffing. I do believe there's a component of that which was better, but this is in the urban areas. I don't believe the districts or the rural areas have had any advantage of the delay. Also, the second thing I saw recently. The second thing you mentioned was 26 percent, right? In the in the moderate to severe category, yeah, 22 percent. Yeah. The second thing is today, just looking at a general forward, which says that maybe our uh, our, our lack of hygiene. Uh, led to some sort of uh, improved outcome in covid-19 because you know the immunogenicity of the constant bugs who are part of our existences and ecosystems led to it it's all speculation i think at this point and uh, so i have my doubt this thing is being discussed absolutely i have my doubts on case fatality at the same time i do have a confidence in the fact that we did get drugs i also believe that we did a lovely job in this country by the regulator the government giving us remdesivir and that was one of the best things which has happened which has not happened even in the most developed countries including the elections which people must be quietly watching as as uh, as uh, this program is going on so i think that was an interesting part of it so few factors here and there which may have contributed to india being slightly more fortunate than the rest of the world right what do you have to say dr parikshit yes i i agree with meta sir i think you know yeah. few factors there as he mentioned you know we have to question our data again if you have uh, the bangladesh mortality which is way lower than uh, italy's mortality then we have to be questioning the data collection in a lot of countries you know the patients were also got like posthumous pcr testing done which is something we disallowed in india again till a long not have antibody testing or antigen testing in india so in already by the time covid had hit the southern parts of the united states they were really diagnosing a lot of patients with antibody testing so again you know death uh, in a patient who has had covid is really difficult to define um again how many of our patients are institutionalized before death that is also something that we need to ask in in, in the western world it's rare for a patient unless it's really an emergency to be not institutionalized uh, during his terminal illness so again uh, a, lot, a lot of that comes from it again i think because of our lockdown we we did uh, get this disease late, late. by that time at least a few things were clear you know because in the beginning i remember we had a lot of debate about when and how to use steroids because our h1n1 experience had showed us that you know at the end of the pandemic in h1n1 steroids probably led to increased mortality so people were in very comfortable with using steroids at the beginning of the pandemic by the time it came to india we at least knew that in, in hypoxic patients steroids have a mortality benefit so at least that little bit of mortality benefit we got here in india so i think you know questionable uh, data then again pandemic coming to us late yeah. that was an advantage as met sir very rightly said i mean remdesivir availability yeah. is is huge in india um i remember when we were uh, actually video calling with with uh, my, you know my alumni at stanford university for one of our patients yeah. they were absolutely stunned that we were, we could get remdesivir at the drop of our yeah. hat in india i think we have had too much of remdesivir and too easy uh, in terms of procuring it compared to some of the western countries i mean you know by 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 culture we are a resilient nation so you know that that sort of helps us in a pandemic situation because we are we, we know and we we learn how to do things the non ideal way but in the western world when they are hit by something 
in which they are really struggling to keep their heads above water. They probably even struggle when it comes to medical management. A few of my colleagues in the US could not even get paracetamol in a timely manner when the peak, when the peak of the pandemic was going on in New York. So I think many of these things. We are also a young country by demographics. So most of the Indian population is is a young population, um, and, and then we have very smart people like Mehta sir amongst us. So I think all these factors led to lower mortality in India. Mm, that is nice. That's a, that's a good explanation. Okay, now for both of you, I think um, all our uh, viewers would want to know more about solidarity trial. But I think it is. rather than trial it is just a collation of data of various drugs isn't it so how do we interpret it and whether that is really useful for our day to day practical management of the patients that's for both of you absolutely i i i, I think meta sir i i will voice my thoughts on this and then i would love to hear your thoughts i think you know as far as solidarity trial is concerned we are again lumping together four anti virals or four different modalities therapy there is very little data or very little clarity on you know what sort of other uh, treatments these patients have received again i think the nature of the solidarity trial is that it is spread over i think 30 countries so every country every local body every local institute must have had their own protocols other regions in that so it's it's a, the, the the structure itself is is a very um, sort of diffuse structure if i can put it that way so there are a lot of inherent biases in that again if you see solidarity trial we don't have the exact data on it it's it's like roche claiming that you know tocilizumab you know, doesn't work and then roche claiming that it works so we really don't have any good numbers and in terms of you know peer reviewing it or getting down to the details it's it's not a double blinded trial so it's an open access uh, trial in which one arm is 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 remdesivir or 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 one uh, another arm is the antiviral agents so i think that leaves a lot to be desired again with a with a with a probably better structured trial like actt also we are starting to see that remdesivir benefit in terms of mortality or probably was for the patient who, who needed low flow oxygen to begin with and that's what Uh, meta cells data also reflects on but again we have to ask ourselves that you know mortality is not the only end point all disease shortening uh, its effect on long term sequelae like you know what is going to happen with sequelae like microthrombo pulmonary fibrosis if we sort of get the virus early in the course of the illness these are questions that we have to ask so i will definitely take solidarity trial with a pinch of salt before throwing all the antivirals into the trash can and saying that you know no antiviral works exactly it really that, gave a very negative uh, message also that there is no drug and nothing works actually but this is very important point which i was going to pick up next that there are primary and secondary endpoints which most of the trials tell us or show us primary being the mortality benefit which uh, most of the trials have given away and they say length of stay or whether the patient is going on ventilator or not or the length of ventilator days and similarly now we are seeing so many patients coming back with post covid sequelae like breathlessness after going home and they come back for admissions or pulmonary fibrosis so this early remdesivir or 5 days or 10 days of remdesivir whether it will have effect on the long term outcomes is also something very important and dr mehta did you have any data about Are that you? or just any uh, no anything that you Now know the uh, surprise came back to you well, while looking at this post covid no uh, no so that's yeah. been a big challenge yeah. and uh, i think uh, on the last point also parikshit solidarity is you know analysis is quite accurate parikshit thank you for the compliment and i give it back to both you and prachi uh, the first of us and the second thing is solidarity just like the output we are going to make is a med rx thing right now it has to go through peer review and i'm sure very very bright reviewers are trying to plug holes in it with all the things which uh, parikshit uh, talked about and you know, it was tweeted the maximum a very lumper sort of concept and let's also add one thing that was very minimalistic upload because the pandemic was had hit everybody it was going march to june and you know literally the italian prime ministers crying and looking at the mortalities at that time they just had to upload very very minimalistic stuff so many things out there and as we pointing out they have not looked at early versus late i mean let's face it early part it's virus as you're trying to ask the question it's early part it's virus somewhere comes inflammation in the midst of it you have the thrombosis the uh, devil playing its note there is a comorbidity dance going on then there is complications and then you are asking about the question of post covid so if you look at a cascading effect then you believe that you can only act at a certain point they come early you give them the antiviral they come later the steroid works better 
so this is what it's like now now we all of us think naively believe that a leads to b so if you give the right antiviral anti steroid or cocktail so to say you're hoping that you're nipping this entire covid process it's it's uh, sequelae and its long term consequences in the bud so at least the serious ones don't come back so this has been the faith again it's faith at this point i don't think we'll ever be able to answer that on a practical note yes we do see patients come back who come back with that fever later uh, after 9 10 days and so on and we all are wondering whether that 5 days was enough or 10 days was would be required of remdesivir to you know bring your old question back in the picture we see that there are fewer lymphocytes out there their you know ct which parikshit has touched on is a little low so there is some viral load after 10 days also why is it still there and then you start looking at the fact that you're trying to look at a lumper model of remdesivir that this much works for everybody and so on and so forth probably doesn't probably doesn't so um, again one believes that a proactive antiviral anti inflammatory strategy will impact on post covid sequel life do i have proof no it is just a brief and speculation right actually there was one more observation when we treated so many patients in icu or uh, step down or high dependency unit for example some patients who had rheumatological disorders underlying uh, they actually had better outcomes because maybe the cytokine storm or severe anti uh, severe inflammatory storm was less so do you have any of such experience or what was your experience in connective tissue disorders this is uh, it's a me or parish me okay yes yeah, uh, so connective tissue yeah the connective okay. tissue disorders i know we were also wondering that the patients were taking hcq or say you know methotrexate will they be spared actually no it's been a very unfortunate thing that uh, they have gone through similar stuff especially they have uh, established uh, interstitial lung disease before it's been a nightmare though that subset has done quite bad a subset of uh, uh, connective tissue disease without ild i don't think i can tell you enough about it but ild spectrum has been very very problematic yeah, that was bad what, pre lung yeah. involvement was bad but rheumatoid arthritis or any other connective tissue disorders have you observed so any connection no yeah, ma'am i think um, you know the autoimmune again autoimmune conditions is also spectrum like immunosuppressive conditions when you talk about an immune patient then right from pregnancy or diabetes to you know someone who has had a haplo identical stem cell transplant it's a huge spectrum so i think even within the autoimmune conditions you know you know you have patients who are who have refractory autoimmune conditions or on two or three different immunosuppressants who are on biologics and so this is a large spectrum in general patients who are on biologics i think i have observed that they don't really do do that well when it comes to covid 19 patients who are on very low dose steroids it's it's a little bit conjectural in but but i think overall in my experience i wouldn't say that you know autoimmune conditions the patients have fared better i i think that the risk for direct viral worsening and and to sort of set the cascade of complications rolling itself is is higher up front and then we have data again from even previous meta analysis that many of the biologics like etanercept or um uh, infliximab all these biologics definitely do lead to T cell suppression and and uh, increased vi viral replication. So so I I would be a little hesitant in saying that autoimmune patients do better even without ILD. Without ILD, okay, fine. There is one more question which uh, uh, talks about NIAID trials. So would you any of you like to talk about key inputs about this, Dr. Parikshit? or dr mehta which trials i'm sorry ma'am niaid trial i'm not very familiar which one yes. which trial is that uh, probably the probably mean the actt trial because that was niaid trial right that yeah. because that's the natural allergy of immunology natural immunology yeah actt trial right so then the actt trial if you see like the internal analysis it 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 showed us that you know uh, there is shortening of disease especially for patients who have an ordinal scale of you know low dose oxygen requirement uh, hfn or or me uh, mechanical ventilation and not so much for patients who don't need oxygen when the full analysis came out of more than 1000 patients again we know at this point of remdesivir does help in the select patients to uh, sort of um, hasten the um interval of the disease which means that you know their 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 disease progression is probably halted and their their time to discharge is improved mortality benefit again there was only slight and it was only observed in patients who required 
no flow oxygen. So by the time again, as Mehta sir mentioned, you know, by the time these patients are on NIV, HFNO, invasive ventilation, whether it's the virus or whether it's the cytokine related injury, the alveolar injury has already taken place. So we call it in the phase of alveolar necrosis and apoptosis, and which can be done by using a direct antiviral agent. So again, I think the key takeaways are that you you know using um, remdesivir early, but for patients with lower respiratory involvement, because again. It's not a direct inhibitor of the COVID-19 virus. It's a repurposed drug, which is a which is a general RNA inhibitor. If this would have been a COVID-specific antiviral agent, you know, maybe it would have even made sense to use it as soon as we diagnose COVID-19, because you know we are even halting the progression into the lower respiratory tract. That's really not the case. It, it really is difficult to conceive whether Remdesivir will be able to sort of halt the uh, process of viral integration with with the with the uh, genome and 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 sort of um late the effects later on what it it probably can do is is called the um rna related effects so i think uh, because of the fact that it's a repurposed drug and because of the fact that it's an rna inhibitor and from what the data has shown us i would probably reserve it only for patients who have lower respiratory involvement now i think that really again is an open ended question how do you define lower respiratory involvement do you define lower respiratory involvement only when you see hypoxia Or you define lower respiratory involvement when you see certain CT score, and if yes, you know what do you do about these in between CT scores? You know we have scores of like seven or eight, which are just on the threshold of mild to moderate. So I think those gray areas will remain, and I don't think there will ever be a separate trial which you know sort of addresses these in between patients. We have to always use our clinical judgment. But I think the key takeaways are that early, provided there is lower respiratory involvement, the short disease and Probably slight mortality benefit in patients who require low dose oxygen. Yeah, that's right. Sometimes we have seen that uh, CT scan is not showing so much of involvement, but the patient is having unrelenting cough, which probably has indicator that it is going towards the lower respiratory tract. So sometimes even the clinical decision making also is required. Now coming back to the unanswered questions on Ramdesivir, whether the use in pregnancy, what is to be done about the use in pregnancy? that is still an unanswered question and i don't i haven't come across any trials any of you want to contribute on that well the package insert or the recommendation from the officials obviously said can be used in pregnancy there's not enough data on the other hand there's enough uh, case by case usage, uh, usage based on risk benefit analysis which has been done so it comes under the same thing like kidney was not there before but kidney has some some data and more of uh, opinions based on a lot of pathophysiology pregnancy comes to a case by case basis uh, we have also used it when you have all the criteria where you expect that the viremic onslaught is going to take its toll more than the risk you take of a undeclared uh, study uh, of the drug we have used it on that way but on a official format the obviously the package insert will not endorse it i mean the way i see this entire covid thing in the next few months will go through an interesting thing the monoclonal antibodies are trying to make their you know yeah. uh, space fed so to prevent you from getting into the hospital you have to do the trump thing and take a monoclonal antibody once you hit the hospital if you are in time you will be taking remdesivir and if you have enough of manifestations you will be taking steroid at least this part may become a little clearer as time goes by the rest is still subject to a lot of speculation mm. and some more immunomodulators are also in the pipeline i think like jack janus kinase uh, also there are some studies are promising i think they are coming up okay and coming back to kidney again uh, dr parikshit suppose patient has pre existing renal disease and contributes and contracts the disease and secondly there is no pre existent renal disease and the kidney is getting involved because of the viremia so i think the approach in these two patients would be a little different for the use of remdesivir right absolutely okay. time we are trying to reuse remdesivir beyond Uh, the uh, safety recommendations, for example, you know, you use it in pregnant women or dating women or with mild to moderate renal impairment. Really, we have to ask ourselves: the question is, is the harm going to be more, or is the benefit going to be more? So, I think in those patients, my threshold for using remdesivir will definitely be higher. For example, if I have a patient with kidney injury and he has CT involvement with um, COVID, which is pretty significant, but at that point of time, he is not hypoxic. i will probably wait because i i don't know how much i'm going to gain by using remdesivir and as against that the harm that i'm going to cause by using remdesivir in in the 
explanation that I showed you, you know, in which I have a reasonable confidence pathophysiologically that it is direct viral worsening. And he is definitely worsening in terms of his oxygen requirement. It's also the right window to give him remdesivir when the pulmonary damage is setting in but has not progressed to an irreversible uh, limit. You, at that point of time, you know, if I really feel that the uh, benefit of giving him remdesivir is more, then I wouldn't uh, sort of stick to a, a GFR cutoff of 30. That is the point I was trying to make in the case. Uh, definitely, you know, if I, if I have a patient with a CT score of, let's say, 15, who is not hypoxic, but has a GFR of 23 or 24, I am not going to be using remdesivir in that patient because probably I can afford to wait and there is not much benefit and potential harm. But as, as I mentioned, you know, with, with, with the um, safety analysis and at least with the in vitro studies, the kind of dosage of remdesivir that we are using and the kind of dosage of cyclodextrin that we are using is not tremendously nephrotoxic. So again, if you have a patient who, uh, who has direct viral mediated renal damage, who has baseline good kidneys but has direct viral mediated renal damage and again he is in the right zone, I wouldn't get hung up on that number of uh, 30 as far as the GFR is concerned. So I think it, is, it has to be a very careful risk versus benefit analysis for that for that patient and also trying to understand the pathophysiology without you know throwing in remdesivir blindly. Again, patients who have good livers to begin with and who have good kidneys to begin with really do not have much of a risk as far as remdesivir is concerned. Remdesivir is not like giving someone conventional amphotericin that there is a 50% chance that you are going to fry the kidneys. It's it's not at all that kind of a situation. So that's why we are, we have to sort of uh, stop and ask ourselves is the benefit bigger or is the harm bigger. Right. So ultimately to take home message, we are basically relying on lower respiratory involvement and the earliest uh, hypoxemia setting in but we are not talking about any inflammatory markers to indicate when there is no hypoxia but the inflammatory markers are higher uh, we are still not going ahead with remdesivir or steroid or combination is that right both of you yeah I, so I, I think from again using markers to gauge the extent of direct viral damage is, is not an exact science because you know ferritin uh, uh, sort of um, activated by a viral infection. So viral infection will activate the IL-6 ferritin pathway. A bacterial infection is probably going to more specifically activate the uh, interleukin-1 beta um, IL, uh, sorry, uh, CRP pathway. But again, it's not an exact science. We, we, have, we have known from experience that CRP can be delayed. Again, ferritin may not rise to a, to a certain extent in some of the patients. Again, you have baseline iron deficiencies. Your baseline hyperinflammatory states in some patients, which again sort of muddy the picture. Marker guided use of antivirals is definitely something I will not recommend. We really don't have any pathophysiological or um, patient data on that front. Marker guided steroid usage is a little bit more controversial, as I mentioned. You know, Marla Taylor from from Montefiore, close to where Dr. Mehta has worked. You know, she has uh, shown us that. Um, uh, the CRP guided steroids can be beneficial. I'm, I'm not entirely yet convinced by that, and I'm, personally, I don't do it. I wait for the patient to at least become mildly hypoxic before he turns, uh, before using steroids, especially in, in Indian settings. I mean, we have had 45 patients of culture proven pulmonary aspergillosis in, in, in our setup. So, before really using the CRP guided steroids, I'm a little bit more hesitant. But, but, but again, I, I, like I said, you know, that's really open to a little bit more debate. Definitely, I wouldn't recommend steroids for patients who have baseline low markers, and definitely, I wouldn't recommend antivirals guided by uh, inflammatory markers. Dr. Mehta, your take on that? Yeah, I think I agree because you know basically the whole idea of trying to give a number and give the number as a trigger to start a potent agent is got its own limitations, and it's very simple to try and uh, uh, take the science to that sort of a I would hate to use the word a dumping level, but it doesn't work that way. And we're seeing this constant variation where CRP is not going the same direction as ferritin and there's a leftover ferritin and the patient's doing well and there's a D-dimer which insists on not getting better and so on and so forth. So each one's, you know, I like to call it the veto component, viral, inflammatory, thrombotic and other. That component is quite challenging. So I think to put it into one cookie cutter model may not be accurate. It's attractive. It's very nice. You love this thing. Give me an IL-6 number. I'll give tocilizumab. Give me a CRP. I'll give steroid. Give me a lymphocyte count. I'll give this drug and so on. But it probably won't work that way. So I think it'll still remain an art and a science. Use the data to whatever advantage you can and then customize your treatment 
hoping that you get better outcomes in this horrible disease. Um, so I think that sort of effort should be at the primary care level, wherein we are trying to get everyone at least to a basic level of of therapy. When we are working in tertiary or quaternary settings, when we have access to these daily markers, when we have access to so many things, I I I I think you know we shouldn't really have that sort of a uh, cookie cutter approach. I I think that can work you know at primary care centers in rural areas where when we tell them that you know if the patient really turns. Hypoxic. That moment, you start steroids. But I, I, I think in 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 more sophisticated centers, we have the ability and the means to practice much better medicine. Right. So I think we have answered most of the questions put by the audience as well, and we have covered maximum aspects of remdesivir and the current pandemic what we are facing. And I would like to give it back to Dr. Sunny, and thanks for giving us opportunity to interact and discuss with. The audience about the use of remdesivir in the current times. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Sunny, uh, he had been facing uh, technical problems, so I will uh, I will uh, take it over from here to conclude this session. So, on behalf of Helen, uh, uh, I would personally like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Prachi, Dr. Vindu Mehta, and Dr. Parikshit. For uh, driving this very engaging discussion, I, a lot of insights came out. I am sure a lot of decluttering also happened. Uh, there is too much noise, uh, as I saw in one of the questions, and it, it, it is essential that uh, uh, these kinds of discussions we have, which would uh, declutter a, lo uh, a lot of confusions. And once again, I would like to uh, uh, thank all of you and all these who have uh, who have. Uh, 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 taken their time and and uh, for this session uh, we will be having more such discussions because we understand that this is a dynamic uh, space which will be changing and there will be a lot new updates probably in the upcoming months also uh, till we come to a definitive solution to this pandemic so uh, once again uh, i would like to thank all of you for 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 being a part of the session and we hope to interact soon so till the time we meet again uh, we island wish all of you a safe and a healthy future thank you thank, thank you. you thank you bye bye thank you bye bye thank, thank you bye, you. bye sir bye bye, bye. bye.